I'm here. Oh, great. We're all here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. There Hi, you go. here. <laughs> all right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, welcome to today's webinar, a student response to analytics, privacy, and security. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we go can you through... Hear me? Yes, we can, Linda. As we go through, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and we'll make sure to get to those. We're going to try and hold questions until after the presentation so we don't disrupt the flow, but if there seems to be a question we need to jump in and answer, we'll be sure to do that. The webcast is being recorded and we'll make sure to send you a link to the recording the PowerPoint slides and any resources that were shared as soon as we can, early, likely early next week. And if you'd like to follow along on Twitter, we tend to have a pretty active Twitter discussion and the hashtag is WCET webcast. Just to give you a sense of the direction we're headed today, we're going to do brief introductions, an overview of data analytics in higher education, We'll jump into a moderated conversation around data privacy and the security of information. Then we'll get to our wonderful student presenter who will share what students want you to consider when you're using their data. We'll get to audience Q&A. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. Also feel free to use the chat to communicate with us. I'd like to go ahead and pass it along to our moderator for today. Rob Robinson is the Senior Principal Partner Strategy Consultant with Civitas Learning. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Um, really happy to be on the, the webinar today. Um, and as sort of a way to set the stage um, for the, the conversation, I want to take just a couple of minutes and paint a picture of, let's call it the evolution of uh, student success systems. Um, and it's, you'll see that this is really um, uh, key to how systems are collecting um, uh, data, right? So the first order is, um, we can click that, there we go. Um, the way to think about this is before roughly 1990, uh, most institutions did not have um, any consistent automation around their internal processes. Um, and then we saw the rise of what we now call the student information system, um, ERMs, CRMs, those, those type of things. And so we saw a phase where institutions adopted very quickly um, these systems and began to automate many of the uh, registration activities. Certainly there were internal things like payroll processing, um, but even from the student facing side, uh, course availability, course records, students grades, um, they began to be collected into these systems of record. These are the foundational elements on which we can assert and demonstrate that yes, the student has completed uh, the required curriculum and we're able to grant them the credentials that they've earned. Um, super important systems and all institutions have this now. And then moving forward in time, we began to see what, what we'll call systems of engagement. And these are systems where we were attempting to bring automation and some of the, some of the insights that were created um, in the development of um, distance learning, frankly, into all aspects of teaching and learning. So we began to see uh, institutions, again, in rapid fashion, begin to adopt learning management systems or VLEs. Um, a little later in this period, we began to see, certainly see the push around mobile student, uh, using the student's handheld device to increase their engagement. Um, it certainly had an impact on pedagogy where it's used, but the important thing to understand is that it also is beginning to collect data. So how the students are engaged with the content can now be recorded at a very granular level through these systems of engagements. And again, uh, going into the 2000s, many institutions were like, I'm not sure what these things are. And suddenly they looked over their shoulder and the institutions to the, to the, in their region are, were all adopting Blackboard or WebCT and they sort of came on it very quickly. And we all know the, the, the consolidation growth of that market. Again, I would, I would assert that it, it's ex exceptionally rare to find an institution that does not have one of these on their campus. And now we're entering a phase where I would call it 
um, the requirement for a, systems of, a system of intelligence. And what I mean by that is we have deployed on our campuses and through historical data, um, uh, if you can go back, uh, there we go, um, systems that um, can now make sense of the data that we have, right? So, so here we're talking about a true analytics infrastructure. And I think we're just on the, on the, on the tipping edge of this. Uh, many institutions are beginning to do this. Some are, some are rolling their own, coming out of an IR shop or an IT shop or an IE shop. Um, some are um, using products like uh, Civitas Learning, uh, EAB, there's others out there. But the key is, the inputs into these systems of intelligence are these other two predicate systems. And from there, we can actually begin to discern really interesting critical insights on which institutions can then move forward and leverage towards student success. The, out, the, the goal of these is student outcomes, um, where the engagement systems and the systems of record were uh, in some ways, uh, well, there were certainly uh, keyed to focusing on different aspects, but now we can use those as inputs into an analytics infrastructure. All of this calls into question the data that the institution has and what use is it going to be? How are the data going to be used to benefit uh, students in particular? And to help me unpack that, I'd like to introduce our panelists very quickly. Um, we have Linda Baer, Colleen Carmine, and Emma Tilson, and I'd like to quickly ask them to introduce themselves. Linda? Hello, I'm happy to be with you on this uh, webinar. Uh, currently, I'm a senior consultant in my own consulting firm. I do higher education consulting, but I have been on campuses I uh, worked in higher ed for over 35 years, and I had a wonderful stay at the Gates Foundation in student success and also worked as a senior fellow in the Next Gen Leadership Academy at Civitas Learning. Thank you. Colleen? Hi, everyone. This is Colleen Carman, Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Innovation at University of Washington, Tacoma. And uh, I'm here today because I co-curated and co-edited the um, analytics handbook that sort of started this discussion for the webinar, taking uh, experts in, in this, as Rob is talking about, this very new implementation of, of data in an in in exciting new way that allows us to see, um, see our students, see our operations in real time and, uh, and then think about how to move from the, the exciting uh, implementation of a new technology to thoughtful use. And that's what we're working on here in Tacoma regarding especially um, uh, what are our obligations to the students when we have all this data brought together in, in sort of then and integrated ways. Yes. Great, Colleen, thank you. Um, as we go forward, Colleen, might want to ask you to move a little closer to your mic. Thank okay, you. sure. And Emma, yeah. quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, I've made my way through a couple different um, institutions of public comprehensive research, and I'm actually back at a community college right now. Um, while also working at Witchy here in Boulder, Colorado, um, I'm working with programs and services and I'm, I'm a sponge. I'm taking it all in and uh, learning quite a bit. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Um, I'd like to ask um, Linda and Colleen to take a few minutes and talk about that chapter that um, you were just re referencing. From the book. Um, actually, it's sort of two chapters into Well, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. In two chapters interwoven where we looked at how the University of Washington would create an actual institutional policy that would guide all practitioners that were using our analytics engine. And uh, as we leaped into some really hard decisions on what data 
different departments would be allowed to see. For instance, no department is allowed to see our students' um, health wellness records, right? No department is allowed to uh, use the data to do geo-tracking. Um, we then dug a little bit deeper and said, well, what, in this very new field, what do our students know or understand or want to agree to regarding the use of the data. And so we had a, a, a wonderful student, and Emma will talk a little bit about you know, her reflection on his chapter and her experience. We had a wonderful student named Avery Horton dig in and, and, and ask other students and think about and do some research on implications of using data about you, even if it's in support and services, but without you really understanding because it's such a new it's such a new uh, approach right and just as the way industry wrestled with it and made some missteps um, uh, Avery wanted to ask us not to make any missteps on the on the University of Washington end and Rob we were especially interested because we wanted to uh, encourage students to be empowered that these uh, data points and this uh, insight we're gaining from the data needs to be embraced by the student as well as advisors and faculty. So part of this is doing the best we can, um, but including the student's voice, the student's intentions, and the student's expectations of what we're doing with data. Yeah. And um I think we have uh, the next slide is uh, yeah a little bit of some of the background and 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 insights that went into some of this. Yes, yeah, so I'll pick up there. Um, we we really wanted people to understand you can have the very best intentions. We want to do the best we can for students, and we leap in with mountains of data sometimes, and and we don't always think about all of the uh, eventualities that can happen. And so we're really calling this um, unintended consequences, quote, do no harm, unquote. Uh, in my fair city of St. Paul, Minnesota, where we have about three feet of snow right now, um, we, we saw uh, evidence of this when the city of St. Paul, Ramsey County, and the St. Paul Public Schools got together and decided, boy, we could hire a, a, an analytics firm and they could gather data to help our students. One was to help them uh, work towards fewer dropouts. So they wanted signals to help them understand better when was a student in trouble and when was there the likelihood of dropout. So they took things like zip codes, income, truancy numbers, race, and other indicators. But they also decided, aha, while we're gathering this information, we could also do risk analysis on who might be more likely to get into some delinquent behavior or fall into some crime or gang behavior. So again, good intentions, families hoped that this was going to help students succeed better in school. And what came about after really three or four years of this was suddenly the worry that children are going to get labeled. Labeled those who had not committed a crime, as future troublemakers and that worried people the parents the advocates and then ultimately the school and these partners and so the agreement ended after five years so we think there are some lessons to be learned with this story yeah th that whole idea of unintended consequences is um it's rife because when when as folks begin to understand um what a, a set of data might be able to tell them they really need to be um, guided with some sort of ethical principles and also stay true to the original intent of the of the agreement for which the data is to be used. Um, you know, what, how do you think um, institutions could help mitigate some of these unintended consequences? Well, we believe you can get into the idea of really taking your responsibility very, very clearly as to uh, helping students know and, and helping those that have access to data know the best way to use it. And Colleen has some examples of that on, on the work on privacy, security, and silos. The next slide. 
Sure. Um, I, you know, I think part of the answer is, is the ideas of actually moving insights to some kind of positive action is so important and it's moving really quickly. And how do we um, understand the difference between profiling and using a powerful predictor about a certain population and helping the students who are here now based on what we know from the students a year or two uh, in the, uh, go in the violation of data. And I think one of the, so the University of Washington put this very clear policy in place regarding, as I said, what data is going to be used and, and how you could use it and what permissions you need, might need or suggest. Uh, one is that uh, don't send a, a message out to a predictor population without having a team vetting it. Um, I actually learned that lesson and, and sort of passed it on to my university from when we first got into analytics and Rob told me the story of a registrar that used a powerful predictor to kindly send the form to drop out to students who were struggling so they wouldn't have to, you know, uh, struggle with finding that form. Well, what does that do that, that you get a message from the institution that's suggesting you should drop out, right? Don't do that. Don't um, uh, play to students' strengths not to, not to uh, point out, oh, the exciting data that you found for the first time in, in your, in your um, pattern ma matching and using the software. And, and it, and it was that kind of uh, um, work exploration stories that, as I said, got Avery to, to write a response to the University of Washington policy saying students do want you to do good and to keep us on track and to help us to the finish line. But, you know, please think about your responsibilities for what you're communicating to us, what we know about how you're using our data. And, uh, you know, involving student government or people who would be um, tasked with thinking deeply about what data you're using and how you're using it uh, to, to help us and, and you know, not, not to do those unintended consequences. Yeah, absolutely. This slide, I think, um, helps address at least some of these some of the core steps that can be done to help mitigate some of these unintended consequences. So including the student bill of rights that Avery writes to in the chapter, we also look at what you as an individual, an advisor, a faculty member, a campus leader can be doing about um, student privacy. And what we have to do is begin with the premise we are responsible for protecting the privacy. So one is become more educated about data privacy. What is it? What are your obligations? What are your responsibilities? Um, number two, use data to improve holistically. So you may have one indicator in one part of what's going on, but uh, the better ability to serve students is multiple points, multiple in, uh, sets of information, and hopefully you have systems that are enabled to merge data or allow you to go from student service data, advising data, res life data, uh, uh, academic data. Hopefully you have a full scan of all of the kind of data to help you better understand what you're protecting here. Then use the availability of analytics to ask great questions. This should be you being a data sleuth, you being someone who cares about how to improve what's going on for each and every individual student. And so look at this as exploration. You want to ask great questions based on the data and explore what do you know about these things? What do others know about these things? How can you improve what you're doing ultimately? Uh, I think the fourth part is predictives should complement human intuition you are still the brain power behind this. Students are understanding who they are, what's going on, why they are, where they are, where students are at which point in their student learning cycle. And finally, include students in the conversation. 
So as Colleen said, go to student government or student uh, focus groups or any number of ways to get students in the conversation to empower them to not only have access to their own data and see their progress or see when they're in trouble, but also access to what can I do about this or who should I be talking to to help me move through when I have difficult uh, situations arise. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 that, that first point, I think we're at a, a great point in time given um, GDPR, the year of GDPR, um, in terms of becoming educated about data privacy. I think it's an opportunity for all of us to take what is going on and the, the sudden realization or shock at many of our institutions that yes, they need to be in compliance with GDPR. Um, as an opportunity to push a conversation internally with our institutions around um, being explicit around what, what we're collecting and how we're using it um, to, to, to help student success. I'd also comment on the, the fourth one. Um, I work with a lot of institutions on, on, on leveraging the insights that their data are providing and frequently there's a there's an excitement around finding the, the unknown or the aha moment. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. But what I find to be much more powerful is when you can use data analytics to give some precision to what has been known through experience and gut. Like, that we know that there's risk around this behavior, but let's get really precise. Now the data are telling us that for our students, here's the exact point at which some of these behaviors might impact their persistence or graduation. That is very uh, affirming uh, and it allows the analytics to not be in conflict with people because people at the end of the day are the ones that are doing things with all this, but to, to come alongside them and really uh, move this, move all of this forward. And, and we are definitely going to be talking about number five um, here in just a, just a moment. So, so if we can go to the next slide. Um, uh, Colleen, I think this is something you've got something to say about. And, you know, Rob, um, I'd love your reflection on this. Uh, the Q&A has a comment in it that uh, I've been thinking about. It, it, it reminds us that the source about, of data yeah. is important and remember that FAFSA can only be used for award and administration. Um, we wrestled with that at UW and we um, con we did much consensus building on agreeing with that, but also noting that our students who receive Pell Awards, um, we could use that data in meaningful ways. Only a few people at the institution are allowed to see the names, but we are allowed to do powerful predictors based on Pell eligibility. And this addresses that in a fascinating way. It shows us that students who are in the murky middle, who get Pell money, but not enough Pell money because their family isn't poor enough, they are so much more likely to leave the institution than the students that got the full Pell. And that says such an important thing and is a, a, a realization that we hadn't quite been dealing with. You know, there is that information in the literature about the murky middle in a number of ideas, but the idea that we work with these students, they get Pell money, they're not poor enough, and they leave is just devastating to me. And it really then becomes, what do you do with that insight that you've never had before? And how do you take it to an action so that you uh, acknowledge and see those students and help them and not let them fall away without you noticing, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I would add that the question is, is the comment in the, in the Q&A is, is, is spot on. There are um, extra levels of protections and concerns for certain sets of data that everybody in the conversation around analytics needs to be uh, aware of and understanding. Um, there are data points in the FAFSA data 
that I think would be extremely additive to understanding what's going on in our students' lives. The whole idea of life and logistics as a thing that can knock them off, that it's not just academic performance, that there's other things in there. Yet, that's a pot of data that is sacrosanct. We're not going close to that. We are not gonna to touch that. Um, it has appropriate extra protections around it. There are ways that we can come up with some proxies for some of the things that we would like to get to. Um, based on some uh, innovative uses of the existing data. But understanding um, and, and being super clear around the uses to which the data are going to be put, right? That we need to be very, very not, hey, we're just gonna stir the pot and, and, and uh, somebody's gonna do some research on this. Um, we're, we're gonna align all this work toward improving student outcomes. Um, that's a demonstrable and defensible position um, that allows some of the use of this data. Um, it is an open question, and I think it's an interesting and ongoing question that frankly was spurred by GDPR around um, who owns the data, right? What is it, um, what's appropriate, what's, what's, uh, what's allowed, and what is, uh, what is not permissive? Um, yeah, so um, this might be a good time to bring in our student into the conversation. Emma, if we can click onto the next slide so that we get her picture right there. Mm -hmm. Emma, you wanna um, just take a few moments and, and uh, I know you've been thinking about this and then, then I'd like to have sort of a, a, a free ranging conversation for a few minutes. Of course. Yeah, I think, and, and to kind of um, bring in the, just the conversation that we were having, um, number five actually, include students in the conversation. Um, I, I think a really good point I would like to make would be don't go for the obvious student. Um, you know, my, my role in this is to, is to say that, you know, Avery wrote an amazing, amazing chapter. Um, and I agree, I actually agree with it. I think, I think it'll be very relevant and, and educational for everybody. Um, but I, I'd like to dive just a little bit deeper and, and go into, you know, my personal experience and um, what kind of student to actually include in this conversation. Because I can only speak obviously for myself. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to not go just for the student who is already engaged in this kind of um, um, world. Um, you know, I, I grew up around it, I'm very lucky. Um, but go, go for the students who maybe aren't so educated on data. Um, you'll have to teach them but that's what educational institutions are for. Um, you know, go, go ahead and, and go for the not so obvious choice because I think they will bring to the table other observations that I may not even be able to see, you may not be able to see, et cetera. Um, again, having said that, um, my experience with this has been quite interesting. Um, Megan actually asked me to do this um, because of some comments I'd made on, on uh, in a panel that I went to at WCT quite a long time ago. And I didn't realize I had strong feelings about student data um, until I kind of started reflecting on my experience with it. Um, and I'll just very briefly tell you one of my very vivid uh, memories. I was uh, transferring from my public comprehensive to the research institution and they were asking me all these questions and, and I was very overwhelmed. And we came up to a question about race ethnicity. And um, I, I grew up in a fairly, fairly liberal um, upper middle class home, um, but I, am, I have been told that I'm, I'm Native American, uh, Latina, and I actually wrestled with this. I had to put down my computer and put down my pen and walk out and call my mother. Um, you know, and I was in my, my early 20s and, and that was quite an experience for me uh, to wrestle with that, that kind of question this, this late, you know, that kind of late in my life. And to call my mom and say, I don't know what they're asking me. I actually, I'm, I'm wrestling with this. Are they asking me my like 23andMe results? Or are they asking me my, how I identify as a human being um, and how I've grown up, um, which is with a Irish, Scottish family, German, you know, uh, and, and they're all from Virginia. Um, how, how do they want me to answer that question? And so again, um, my, I think my real experience, I hope, it, I hope it just brings up something else for all of you in that um, you know, it's, it's a lot more than just a number. Um, and Avery actually says that, you know, he says, um, you know, try to resist the temptation um, to reduce a student to a mere set of statistics. And um, 
I think I think that that's really going to be what I'm what I'm kind of here to to talk about and what I resonated most with within his chapter was really try and understand what you're asking these students and then really try and explain that it's not all that simple to go through this um, and even with my parents who are in higher education even though I've grown up around it I still had to call my mother um, that's that's kind of yeah that's that's my experience with that so please yeah. The, the, and I think that's it, it's such an important point. Um, again, it's been my experience that um, uh, after working in higher ed for a long time, um, that it, we are sometimes guilty of what I think I would call lazy thinking, uh, being reductive around the, the overused term of at risk and reducing it to a set of um, uh, a set of attributes, right? And, and uh, you know, I firmly believe that demography is not destiny. And there's so many other things that the, that the full picture of data can inform us around folks that, that one attribute is not going to overwhelm the others. Um, and, and, and it's really important that we take, as, as Linda said, a holistic view uh, around what the data are, are telling us. I'd like to tee up another question, though. Um, this, there is a, it, it's been written about a lot. There is, let's call it an implicit bargain. Um, uh, when, when, let's say, students are asked to give up the data, um, there is some sort of expectation that they get something in return. And I'd like to have all the panelists' uh, thoughts on this because Sometimes we're explicitly asking for the data and frequently we're asking them simply to use systems from which we are going to collect the data. So there's, there's already a transparency issue there, but really this idea of what is the, what is that bargain and, and is it an appropriate bargain? I'd like to start with Emma actually. Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say I'd like to see more customization um, when it comes to my education um, and if I'm giving my data. Um, I'll use an experience I had. I actually left that out of my introduction. I worked at Western Governors University in Salt Lake City, Utah um, before Wichi. And um, I, I was honestly pretty amazed at how they customize your education. And I was like, why aren't more institutions doing this? Um, they give us their data. We are transparent about how we're going to use it. I know that because I would tell them exactly how we were going to use it. And we would give them a customized learning plan, basically. Um, and we gave them support, and it was always a one-on-one -on -one process. And I had students who graduated call back to enrollment, which is where I actually worked. So two years after, you know, they, they finished their degree, they called me back. They said it was completely like you said it was. It was one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I was like, why am I not seeing this? in the other institutions especially since I've gone through that enrollment process with other schools and I'm paying more money so why am I not seeing that where's where's that bargain if you will Rob and I'd, I'd, I'd open it up to the other panelists I mean from from um, taking on more of an institutional hat where how do we how do we communicate this this bargain if we if we're putting it in those terms well I think there's a clear issue that says uh, we are we are purveyors of data. Uh, my worry is we have mountains of data, so much that sometimes people don't know where to start. And once they do decide where to start, my my biggest worry is we now know we have an obligation once we know to do something. And so I think the data to the insights about student behavior about what makes for better success means we've got to build better systems that support success. And so sometimes our systems aren't necessarily strong around supporting student success. We may have hundreds of interventions, and I would ask people to think about how many interventions do you have? Do you know how well those interventions are working for which students? And so I think we have an obligation once we have data that we should be doing something about it and do something that ends up with impact. I'll chime in on that and I'll say, yes, we do have an obligation 
Uh, but we go back to that bargain idea. What is the bargain we're making with the students? Uh, it, it occurs to me that, you know, Emma is data smart and most of our students, I would make the case, aren't. They don't really think about what we're collecting about them or how it's being used. They understand the registrar has their grades, right? <laughs> they understand that. But I, I think that's why I did like Avery's ideas of, of how you need to bring an understanding of analytics or even data literacy on what we have on the students to a body that can discuss it and can think deeply about what might be done with that, right? And, and to Avery's point, once that's in place, please don't screw it up, right? Don't do no harm really is, is the bargain I think that he's asking is, is it is so important to support our students on, on their path to graduation with data instead of the stories of 25 years ago, which is such a significant part of that. But we're new to this, and, and his, I think his, his basic uh, thought was, be careful not to make mistakes. You know, it, it, help the students and, and use these insights to change your own support and services and outreach, but, uh, uh, that there, there is harm that can be done. Yeah, this goes right back to that idea of unintended consequences. And there are plenty of stories around that where perhaps from the best of intentions, um, the wrong things are done. Um, somebody, send, you know, somebody sending a message out that basically says, our predictive models show you're going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> Come see me. Well, that, if we do that, that student's likely to just go, I quit. Um, that there's, there's, yeah, it's, it's really about mixing that the science of the analytics and the art of human engagement, um, I think is, is such an important, important concept. Um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on time here and I, I would love to have uh, some more questions from the audience. And while, while audience members are, our participants are, are thinking of questions, feel free to type those into the Q and A box. Um, on the Zoom screen. Um, but while we're doing that, I'd like to just ask another, another question, particularly of Emma, is really around the concept of privacy. Um, there's been some research, I've seen some, some focus groups and some, some papers written that the concept, or, or not, the, not the concept, but the, but the importance of privacy uh, seems to be more and more diminished uh, in an era of, um, you know, this, where this bargain is, is happening in the background. So I download an app because I want to use it. And in exchange, I, I click through the EULA and say, take whatever you want from my data. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to get your thoughts as, as somebody who's, who's kind of probably living that experience. Yeah. Um, gather my thoughts here for a second. Um, I think as somebody who does live that, I mean, as somebody whose parents were also, you know, like, make sure the privacy settings are there, et cetera. Please, you know, read all the small prints um, before you're, you know, going in and doing that. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of small print, you know. Um, but um, all of a sudden when, when you, again, apply for schools or, or you're, you know, in a class or they're asking you something, all of a sudden it's okay to give all your information. And I think that's a really big juxtaposition and you're asking a lot of us to, to, to switch the way that we think about giving our data. And when it's an educational institution, it's okay. You're allowed to give them everything. Um, and we feel like we can just trust, or we're supposed to, I mean, you know, not necessarily, not all of us feel that way, but um, that we're just supposed to trust them. And I think it, it's a kind of funny analogy is like, don't talk to strangers, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and in this case, you know, an educational institution isn't supposed to be a stranger. It's supposed to be there to help you and guide you, et cetera. But, um, you know, has privacy diminished when it, that's a, it depends on what you're asking of us, I guess, is really, is really what that comes down to. Has it diminished? No. Has it, have we changed the way that privacy matters? Yes. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of dancing around. And that's because, that's because 
I'm not entirely sure, and that worries me actually, I'm not entirely sure, has privacy diminished? Um, only to the extent at which we know what privacy means. What are the small print, right? There's so much small print. Um, it's hard to go through it all sometimes. And I think we're just on overload. Um, so, you know, again, when that nice hand, that educational institution reaches out and says, you can trust us, just give us everything. We just kind of let our barriers down. We do give you everything. Um, and I think we which, should- Yeah, questions. which makes it much more incumbent on us to um, do the right thing. Yeah. yeah. Again, those those unintended consequences. Yeah. Um, panelists, other any thoughts on that? And you know, Rob, even stronger than what Emma's saying, and which we wrestled with at UW, is the ability to collect a data that the students have no idea you're collecting. Right. I mean, like I said, they know that the register has their grades. They know that the learning management system knows how often they log in. Right. Or, or they would if they thought about it. But but the idea that some universities are talking about um, uh, tracking the most popular paths around campus by examining where, you know, the student logged into the uh, tutoring center and then they went to the Starbucks on campus. And then they, the fact that we can do that doesn't mean that the students have any idea that we would do that or, or does it mean that we should? And I think that's part of the fascinating uh, re rapid implementation of technologies that have gotten industry in so much trouble and that I think higher ed might not be all that far behind if they don't, if, you know, if we don't collectively think through the unintended consequences. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, we had a question in the Q&A about the, a California bill regarding a California uh, right to privacy. I'm frankly not familiar enough with it to be able to respond, but I wonder if uh, my compatriots are. Well, I was trying to look up what the the person asking the question uh, specifically meant in relation to its impact on education. I mean, it's, it looks like a consumer bill of rights or a consumer protectionism from uh, people collecting data on you, and I'm looking for where where does it talk about um, the educational component of it? Um, they are certainly claiming the the angst about uh, misuse of data, and um, actually looking at even Cambridge Analytica as yeah. one of the examples. I think, in, in, broadly speaking, again, not not uh, knowing this bill closely, but this is one of a slew, I think, of measures that are, um, we're going to be seeing this. And again, I, I, I anchor a lot of this thinking in um, GDPR. And so folks are rethinking this and making it much more explicit. I think the days of Wild West, which is what we have been in the United States regarding the legal system, the legal framework around uh, ownership of data, uh, I think those days are probably coming to an end. And uh, we are all going to need to pay close attention, not only to our state legislatures, but to federal legislation uh, around some of these some of these uh, new, a new regulatory environment in which things that we have previously done, again, with the best of intentions around student success may become more difficult or the need to be much more explicit around asking permission to do this. Uh, I think that, that that is coming. I don't, I don't see any, any change in that. Well, and I think, you know, along the lines of that California bill, uh, there, there is a discussion about uh, sale of personal information and, and some of those kinds of things. And I, I think one lesson we need to keep in front of us is when you move to working with contractors and, and platform providers, analytic providers, um, whose data is it by the time uh, data comes into a, a, an analysis and then comes back out again? So I would say there's a relationship there, certainly. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, there was another question uh, on, the, on the QA channel, um, essentially asking um, in this age of big data um, that essentially all 
the data footprints are so rich and deep now around every single interaction that students are having with us that we can collect those and we can do things with them. So the question is, how can we be more transparent and inform students in a meaningful manner uh, around the what we're doing with this without overwhelming them or putting it down into a click through ULO that they're never going to read. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd certainly like to open that up. My, my thinking is that the best way to engage that conversation is to show them what we are doing. Um, there, there are lots of ways that one can say, here are some of the, and again, not at the individual student level, but at the aggregate level, the population level. Here are some of the findings that we've seen historically from our students at this institution. Um, and, and, and at least connect our goals of helping the students journey through our institution with their data being a contributor into that. Thoughts on that? Maybe even expanding that a bit to the notion, considering the notion that we have not treated our students like equal partners in their educational experience. We, we I think in some ways have, have treated them like children. And if we, as you suggest, Rob, if we inform them of, of, the, uh, of what the data tells us, if we, um, if we have policies in place, but also if we inform them of some of the things we know that they might not know. So here in part answer to Marsha's question in the Q&A, uh, how do we inform them? I'm thinking about one of, the, one of the actions we did take with what we learned. We learned that uh, students that don't register here at UW Tacoma uh, 20 days or more before the beginning of a term have a much higher tendency of leaving soon after, right? And, and babies need milk. We should have known that they're not getting the courses they want at the times they want and their lives have become harder. Now, they don't know that. Why didn't they know that? Why didn't, why don't, why don't do they know from term to term? Why don't they remember that um, they, they, they're going to be set back by quarters if they can't get into the courses they need? So we use that knowledge and analytics to send an, 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 an email to students who aren't registered 15 days before the start of the term. And then we say, hey, you're not registered. There are still courses, but they're filling up fast. And we get so many thank you notes from the students. It's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's, it's silly almost that, that we don't consider that their lives are so busy, so stressful, so complicated. They're in the middle of final exams. They don't have time to think about registering. But when you remind them that there are implications, they are grateful. That is using real-time data, analytics, to quickly pull a list to everyone who's not registered, saying, hey, and here's the link. And if the, you're having a problem registering, here's the list of advisors for your particular majors. They're, they're always, that, that is a, a, an action for which students have consistently um, uh, said how grateful they are. So there's an example of why it's important to do and how we can do it in, in a meaningful way while telling them, hey, we're looking at your data. Yeah, I, I, that's great. And, and, and not, the art of transparency, right? One of the best ways that you can, you can be transparent about here's what we're doing with your data is to do those things for them because you're, you're basically paying off on the bargain at that point, right? We're, we're gonna do some things that we hope will improve your experience. Um, and the reason we can do it is because we've seen through the data um, that historically students have struggled with this, that, or the other. Rob, can I, can I actually? Please. Um, I'm actually kind of amazed that it, it, some of the transparency doesn't come in, in things like orientation. Um, why not let students tell students what's going on um, and, and do it in somewhat of a creative way. Let those students help you 
disseminate that information and make it more, um, I don't know, ground level understanding, right? Um, why, why can't they be the ones to kind of break that news? And then updates happen and you can choose to read the updates whether or not you want to, but at least a student has a basic understanding of, of what data, what that data means. And I think, again, I think you should let older seasoned students who are usually part of orientation or, or what have you um, do that. And if, I don't know if there's any online online schools here, but I mean, WG do, did that in orientation. You know, what does it mean to be in an online school? What do we use your data for, et cetera? And it, you know, there was a document. But um, yeah, when I was at orientation, you know, let that, let, let that senior tell that freshman that, hey, this is what student data is. If you need more information, go here. It's a student setup page. Um, yeah. I think that would be a really great way. I think yeah, and I've, I've seen examples of this. You know, I think it's a layering of data. So if it's information for students during orientation to improve upon their success, then they should be they should be working with that. And I, sometimes I think orientation is just so much stuff all at once at the beginning when people can't absorb it. So I really think there should be uh, different times when people receive the information. But also I'm aware that, that campuses have, um, you know, ratcheted up different levels of data, like for example, uh, when they perceive that a student may be in trouble with mental health or with, uh, different kinds of behavior there that gets to yet another level. It's not just, well, how do I succeed um, and navigate the, the uh, first term or whatever, but what is it when you start seeing evidence of, of uh, serious behavior or multiple examples of serious behavior? And uh, I think some, some offices have had trouble because of um, not being able to communicate across offices when uh, several examples of difficult behavior begin to uh, show up. Absolutely. Um, we have another question that I think is uh, interesting. They're asking um, uh, for our thoughts on St. Louis's, St. Louis University's Alexa project, um, putting Alexa devices in uh, student dorm rooms. It is, um, <laughs> here's the way I characterize some of these things. Um, we need to be cognizant of the creepy factor. Um, uh, it's, it's easy to um, step over the line into big brother land and um, having a device that's listening all the time, which I have one in my house. And so um, again, I think the devil on that, on that project is that they have to be super explicit with the students as to when it's on, what it's listening for, and what, it can, what, what value can it provide back. Um, other, other thoughts on that? Emma? <laughs> Would you like to have a device in your house? I have like three Alexas in my house. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I, I think, do I want them knowing that, do I care? Do they really need to know that I bought carpet cleaner for my pet? You know, I, <laughs> um, you know, I know that's not exactly what they're looking for, but I think that's just kind of a silly question to, to start off. I mean, I, the elect, I have heard of that project. I, I, I can't speak too much on it. I haven't read into it exactly, but, um, you know, would it, what, I guess, to what extent would it help? I think um, Ellen actually has a chapter in here about what your institution is going to be using data for. What are you going to be using it for? What kind of institution are, are you? Um, and what kind of data do you need from us? Um, I think what WGU needs and what Salt Lake Community College need are completely different. Um, one is serving on a national level, one is serving a very small community. Who needs Alexa? You know, I think that that's a really important question to pose. How big are you? Um, I could see some institutions almost helping me out more. And I'm actually talking kind of about institutions that might be more of a um, live on campus. Like I know CU Boulder is kind of a, a very like comfortable network. There's the hill and a lot of people live up there. And could information like that potentially help maybe um, to make the make everybody feel more comfortable, um, you know, and therefore really sinking into their educational experience um, and, and feeling good while being there. I think, 
I think that's a, actually a really important part of the educational experience is feeling like a community. So that's kind of my thought. Yeah, Great. I'm hearing some really good results of pilot projects using Alexa with specific uh, curated content for a course. So a student who is studying at 11 o'clock at night and can't quite figure out how to do a problem, the instructor knows what the top 100 questions are, but the idea that it's hard to find in an FAQ, the student doesn't know where to go to find it, just to be able to turn to Alexa in their study room or bedroom and say, I don't understand how to do this. What is the answer or how did that get computed? It is so valuable for in-time learning instead of waiting two days to ask the instructor in class. So we've got some tough trade-offs in, in uh, helping students uh, manage manage their learning process in real time in personalized ways and figuring out how to protect their price privacy and data yeah that's good all right I'm keeping an eye on the on the time and uh, I, I appreciate the engaged set of questions and the the different voices that we have on this panel today but at this point I'm going to hand it back over to Megan to do any sort of wrap-up here well, I cannot thank you all enough for your contributions. This has been a great conversation and we are running out of time, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone has access to contact you. If you have uh, any follow-up for any of our panelists, please feel free to reach out to them. And we have a lot going on here at WCET. It's always exciting. We have lots of great contact, content and resources about data analytics on our website. We are in the midst of developing our program for our upcoming summit in Newport Beach, California, and I'm told that it's going to be beautiful. I'm here today and it's a balmy 55 degrees, but at least I don't have three feet of snow like Linda. But this is going to be a really interesting conversation. It's going to be a whole day of setting the context and then a half day of rolling up your sleeves and looking at several what we're call, calling stepping stones that you can bring back to your institution and start building some of these um, mutually beneficial partnerships. Our annual meeting call for proposals is going to launch next week. So we'd love to invite you to submit your ideas and then join us in November in Denver, Colorado. We record all of our webcasts and make them available on our website as well as our YouTube channel. You will be receiving the link early next week. And I want to take a minute to thank those that support much of our work here at WCET. These are our supporting members and then our list of sponsors. So we are very thankful that they help uh, underwrite much of our, our events here. So again, thank you for joining us for this webcast. I hope you found it valuable. Thank you to Rob for stepping in and moderating. And thank you to our presenters for putting together this content and giving us so much of your time. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.